Shalom, y'all. We're doing a Fantasy House Bitcoin bonus episode. This has become one of my favorite things for bonus episodes because I'm a Bitcoin enthusiast. I don't know a ton about it, but I know enough to know that it's badass. Starts with a B, also badass. Badass Bitcoin. That's the name of my podcast. Uh, and and it's, it's just really fun. So I, I was talking to one of my dear dearest uh, friends, Peter Benikowski, or as I call him, Peter, Peter Benikowski. And he, you know, has brought up Bitcoin several times on his posts. And I was like, hey, you want to do a bonus episode? And, and Peter said, yes. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Dude, so stoked. And this is like so last minute that I was like, hey, you want to test out my computer since it crashed and, and, and just do an episode? And you were like, sure. I was like, oh, dude. A fellow coffee drinker, getter dunner. I was like, well, yeah, <laughs> let's make it. Yeah, I'm down. Dude, so it's as you're drinking your coffee. Let me sip my cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah simultaneously. This makes me feel smarter, too, whenever I hold a cup with a handle. <laughs> Does it? It, oh, hurts God, my, yeah. it hurts my wrist. It makes me feel Jewisher. <laughs> Look at us sipping together. It's like we're on chatterbait for coffee drinkers. <laughs> so, dude, how did you find out about Bitcoin? I mean, I was first, you know, I just want to start by saying I'm not a Bitcoin expert. Nothing I say is financial advice. Um, And I also want to back that up by saying I'm not a Bitcoin expert. And Fantasy House nor John Chesky is giving you financial advice. This is for entertainment. I want people to get people's appetite going to, like, look up the real pros, you know? Totally, totally. Like all the people that are on the Rogan podcast that talk about Bitcoin. (laughs) Go to Rogan podcast for the experts. That's right. (laughs) uh what is it uh i got you know i first got into bitcoin i want to say like 2016 when it peaked at like 19 grand a coin that's when my it hit my radar as a general human um and then when i I really got into it and i started looking into it and i kind of mistakenly came away from it in 2016 with the concept oh bitcoin's a big deal because of blockchain technologies Mm -hmm. and that's what i pulled out of it was like this sword sort of uh, this encrypted version that's also open source, multiple ledgers. So, you know, your data is very protected and safe. Uh, And it's just this beautiful construction, this blockchain technology. So let let me break that down just for our listeners so that they they can hear it from me, who I consider myself an on the fringe nerd with an IQ that is so abstract and weird that I can't keep up with actual smart people on a regular, uh, uh, what do you call it, categorical memory. So... Breaking that down for other people like myself, <laughs> the what Peter's talking about with the blockchain is it's a term for uh, a software, um, a style of software that is just telling it, it's a ledger. It's it's keeping track of things. So with a Bitcoin, there it's part of what's called a blockchain, and the ledger means it keeps track. So if Peter has a Bitcoin and I have a Bitcoin and you, the listener, have a Bitcoin. That is all collected in this blockchain. It says this. It says it in every Bitcoin, basically. Right. We all have a Bitcoin, and if Peter uses mm. a, a millionth of that Bitcoin to buy a pair of shoes, then that goes to the ledger, and everyone's Bitcoin says that. It, it yeah, keeps, it gets updated it keeps up, simultaneously. It gets updated, so, and so I, I hope that that's. A, does that sound like a simple explanation for it, Peter? Yeah, definitely. It's like, imagine like every time a Bitcoin moves, there's like just a guy writing down who did what for who. And he writes it down on his ledger. But then everybody has a guy that's writing down the transaction at the exact same time, no matter who makes it. So even if you go interact and you do an exchange with somebody else with Bitcoin, my guy still gets the information, still updates, you know? So everyone's updating simultaneously all at once. And that's a level of transparency that's unheard of in the financial industry and community. Yeah. It's also an overwhelming level of transparency. If you think about like every transaction and I think that that's why it takes so much computer power to to keep the the Bitcoin ledger going. Right. It's one of the big things they're trying to understand and solve is because, yeah, because there's so many finance, there's so many computations that have to happen because the ledger can only grow and that you need these like really large computers. I think they can process only up to five or six transactions per minute. Whereas like a credit card can do tens or 20 of thousands yeah. of transactions a minute. But Bitcoin, there's so much processing power with running that ledger. 
yeah. that only a handful like of transactions can be done because there's so much information. And it actually leads to a lot of, this is all tangential, but it leads to environmental crises with oh, Bitcoin yeah. of how much energy output is done per transaction. It's actually a lot of reports are saying it, Bitcoin is actually bad for the environment. I, I think right now it is. They're trying to transition it and they're trying to solve some of those problems because that's that's that really is at the sure. front the front of the, their priority list because so many people that are interested in Bitcoin are also um, environmentally uh, conscious people that are in yeah. technology and that are you know wanting to create a better future. So they're, they're, there are a bunch of, bunch of companies and investors and um, even volunteer like software programmers that are trying to solve those problems by, uh, I don't even know, again, smart people stuff yeah. that I don't fully understand, but they're trying to be more efficient with the ledger. But why is the ledger I- important? It drew you into it. Let's getting ba- getting back to it. Why is it important? Oh, go, go, yeah, to go back to, so my interest first happened there and I came away with going, oh, the blockchain, that's the important thing that came out of Bitcoin was this technology for encryption mm-hmm. and for... Uh, for transparency, et cetera, and, uh, you know, open source, whatever. The, but the real issue that I came away with in the, I would say late November, early December, as I started getting back into Bitcoin, listening to more podcasts, listening to more interviews, reading more books was no, what really Bitcoin is about is this underlying financial issue around the globe that started in 2008 with the housing crisis. Bitcoin was created in a direct sort of rebellion against the ability for a government to create a lot of money out of thin air and distribute it at their own will. That upset yep. a lot of tech nerdy people. And because so what happens go, when governments do that? Inflation, I right? Mean, the risk you of get inflation. Terrible, yeah, you get terrible inflation. You can. America's super, it was way more secure at the time because you know our dollar was worth a lot more. Uh, the, the world pegs their currency to our currency. So we have a lot more power to manipulate our currency and just tell us to deal with it. But the problem why Bitcoin's getting so successful now is because, you know, inflation compounds at usually roughly 2% is your target rate every year. With compound interest, you know, over 10 or 20 years, you've lost the value up to 50 to 70% of your dollar. Isn't that crazy? So, like money just rotting away. It's so... It's you, weird, yeah. Unless you're risky with your money and you invest it into things, you can't play it safe, which is, again, right. more Terrence McKenna, like, uh, can't move forward, can't can't stand still. If the thunder don't get you the lightning wheel, it's like a Grateful Dead lyric <laughs> he used to bring up. And it's like, it, now it applies to our money where it's like, you want to play it safe and just put it in your savings account? Guess what? It's going to decompose in there. And you're like, what? Right. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, a lot of people don't have good financial backgrounds, just so listeners know. Uh, I'm an accountant. I've been an accountant for like 10 to 12 years now. So, so this like, is my, like financial advice. <laughs> no, no, no. Still that advice. Still that advice. <laughs> I'm just advice. teasing. I'm just teasing. Hashtag <laughs> riffing. Be silly. Oh, have God. fun, folks. <laughs> uh, no, this is financial just, advice. I'm teasing. Yeah, I just wanted people to know that my background is like a little bit in finance. So like I've been around numbers for a while, and I explain numbers to people often. But yeah, a lot of people don't aren't financially literate in knowing that in your savings account, people think, oh, I'm saving money. Well, your money's always rotting. And it doesn't matter when, it always is, you know, unless you've put it in an investment vehicle, like you buy a bond or some stock or you invest in a cryptocurrency, et cetera, et cetera, that will hopefully but was it, grow. Was it always that. rotting though, Peter? Because to me, like when, when it was making, uh, when, when, when I was even, what was I? I was in my late teens, early 20s. Um, I was working at a bank. I was a bank teller and I was learning about... Um, uh, I, I remember I bought, I had a CD, I had a, um, a CD that was like 4% annual rates. And I had gotten a loan for an ATV. My first, uh, like I was buying a brand new, uh, uh Honda uh, quad. Right. Yeah. And I got a loan for like six grand for the quad. And then I didn't buy the quad right away. And I was like, what can I do with the money? And my friend explained to me like, well, just put it in a CD. You can actually get interest on your on the money you just took out and it was 4% and that beats inflation at the time right. by, by a percent or so. So that wouldn't have rotted, right? At that yeah, time. It, it kind of, yeah, that's, that's the thing is though, it depends over time, but at, at, in the grand scheme of things, it's always rotting because if, even if you go back and you look at, <clears throat> I'm talking, if you go back to like the twenties and you talk about somebody who can buy a loaf of bread for a penny, you know, obviously your money doesn't go that far anymore. You can't I buy a lot of bread now. If I could go back. Hundred loaves, please. 
So it all depends where these inflation rate are the, the what the inflation rate is. It depends how the stock market's doing. It depends where the government sets interest rates. There's a lot of factors, but in the grand scheme, the long run, you know, just like in the long run, the S and P 500 index always goes up at least in the last hundred years. Yeah. In the last hundred years, your savings will always rot. You know, it, it it'll change how so and how much it fluctuates, but especially in the last ten years since we've done the bailout. For the housing market and the big banks. And now, because you know, one fifth or 20% of all currency in circulation was created this year, that stat is before this stimulus that's being rolled out here in early January. So they're saying that your your money is gonna rot even faster. It was somewhere between two and five percent you were losing the value of the dollar every year. Now they're saying it's gonna be for the next four years up to 15%. Oh my so, God. There's nothing yeah. to even invest in this 15%. That's there's, exactly there's barely anything. I mean, there's a couple like there's, there's multifamily apartment buildings that can be 15% if you get into the right syndication. But that's, that's all that used to be like, Oh, fucking insanely great return. And now you're like, well, if you can find that and it's risky and it works out okay, then you've broke even. You're like, well, <laughs> yeah. fucking suck my balls. This sucks. That, yeah. So that's why, that's why you see Bitcoin going crazy because Bitcoin, another t- thing about Bitcoin I took away that was kind of wrong was I thought it was going to be a currency. Oh, this is something I'm going to go buy a pizza with, go buy, you know, uh, you know, shoes, you know, parents are always like, well, how do I go buy my newspaper? You know, what? I don't know. If parents yeah. do. I don't know but, who says that, but yeah. Yeah. Nobody says that. I made it up. <laughs> These are all people who don't exist. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I need shoes and a newspaper. Does Bitcoin work? <laughs> it certainly does, sir. <laughs> Who is this person? Why they don't have their shoes? Oh, dude, hypoth- hypothetical Harry. Oh, he's fantastic to work with. <laughs> I love hypothetical Harry. He's a great character um, for anything. So I thought it was going to be a, a currency thing, but it's not. It's a store value thing. And when I say store value, it's like think of gold. Nobody pays for anything in gold. Nobody goes out to a counter with gold dust, going, "Hey, here's an ounce of gold dust. Can I have my Starbucks?" No. You invest in gold because gold generally exceeds. Uh, it rises, its price rises at a rate greater than inflation, which is why people invest in gold. And so Bitcoin is like that, except the because of the way Bitcoin is sort of organized, laid out in the protocol with things like having, which we can talk about in a second, um, people only see its price going up. And then some estimate in the next decade to two decades, you know, it'll be well over worth a million a coin. That's, I mean, that's what uh, I've heard so many times, which is, Awesome if it does do that, mm-hmm. but you there's know, pitfalls. There's pit, there's pitfalls, and also you know, a decade or two decades from now, if it's worth a million a coin, but what you know, are we going to have hyperinflation where it's going to be like the Zimbabwe dollar, where it is going to be you know a million dollars to buy a pair of shoes? Um, but that's the but what you just said in that statement's interesting because you just said a million dollars to buy a pair of shoes. But if you've converted it into Bitcoin, your, your U.S. currency dollars into a Bitcoin, Bitcoin, in theory, should raise at a rate much greater than the dollar would inflate. I see. So if your dollar inflates a thousand percent, like they're saying this about Venezuela. So like in Venezuela, they did have crazy inflation over the last decade, well into the, I think, the thousands of percents. And if you just took all your Venezuelan money, put it into Bitcoin, it would have rose as the as the inflation rate of the Venezuelan dollar exploded or whatever their currency is. When you pulled your money out of Bitcoin, you know, if your fifty dollars blew up and you know what cost fifty cost ten thousand, you know, you would be pulling out a much larger sum of your Venezuelan currency yeah. out of Bitcoin. Uh, That's when, when, quote, every time you say the word Venezuela, it reminds me of the Norm Macdonald. Uh, uh, a quote from one of his uh, comedy albums, which is like, some say he killed a man in Venezuela. And I just always hear that. So um, <laughs> I, I, I think that I understand that where, where it raises, but for our listeners to understand, um, yeah. do you, can you explain why the fact that Bitcoin, so it's on a blockchain, it's a cryptocurrency. So our right, listeners right. understand. So it's a digital currency. It's not backed by gold or anything like that. It's only as valuable right. as the demand is. So we're all yep. playing an imaginary game there. Right. Uh, a consensus reality game about it having value. Uh, it's got the blockchain. Everything's written on the blockchain, which is different than many other um, forms of currency. And right. um, it's finite. Right. So that's explain how, what that has to do with inflation, right? That You said that's the biggest 
<clears throat> that's the biggest deal about it. I mean, one thing, so people, when you say cryptocurrency, people will go, oh, so I should buy a doggy coin or Ethereum. And I would say no, um, only because what makes Bitcoin special is every other coin you can name on the market in the cryptocurrency market was generated by either an individual, a group of individuals or a company. Mm -hmm. And why that's bad is because that means it's centralized. It's not this shared knowledge that any nobody can adjust. Like with Bitcoin, because the ledger is generally stored in these mining companies or individuals who mine, they're the ones running the ledger. That's why they get rewarded with coin every once in a while yeah. for mining, because they're the ones actually running this large mathematical computation. And, and that's a whole other conversation for a different right. episode. But yeah, yeah. Right. Bitcoin right. mining. It's, it sounds very physical yeah. and technical, but it's, it's very interesting. And it actually relates to what we were talking about before, the environmental taxing. Uh, that totally. Bitcoin. But we'll, we'll do that in another episode. Okay, so, so fine. So all these other cryptocurrencies, they're, they, they can be manipulated by that company, that individual, that thing, whereas Bitcoin cannot. And when I say finite, there was an instance with Ethereum where I believe either somebody lost a chunk of Ethereum or it was stolen. So the company just made more Ethereum that the, the company that sort of created Ethereum just created more Ethereum. Well, that's the problem with currency. Yeah. You don't want to just be able to create more US dollars because you lose the value of the dollar. So with Bitcoin, in the protocol, the way it's set up, which nobody can manipulate because everybody has that code in their uh, ledger, there's a set amount at 21 million. Right now, I believe there's, only, there's 18 or 19 million Bitcoins that have actually been mined. And every four years, the amount you can mine ha uh, halves to like a, a smaller and smaller amount. And you get this, excuse me, in math, what's called a logarithmic curve. So it's the inverse of an exponential curve. I was just going to say, it's, it's like mirroring exponential. Like we're going backwards now, folks. Very Willy right. Wonka with this thing. So it rises super fast, but then it just plateaus and rises super incrementally is a logarithmic curve. And why is that a good thing? Like uh, it may... That's a good thing because inflation, the, the, the whole point of value is scarcity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you said what was interesting, what was funny about Bitcoin is that, you know, it's this thing that, you know, it only has value if we all say it has value, but that's true of any currency. Oh, you yeah. know, the, the dollar is just paper. It's not even tied to gold anymore. But you, you can know? buy, you can buy like anything with it. You can pay someone to have sex with you. You can buy food. You can, people labor, totally. they give their lifetime away in the words That's of Jim true. Morrison. Turn in your house for a handful <laughs> of dimes. But like you're literally yeah. buying people's lives with, with, with an imagined, can you hear my kids screaming? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's I a pandy. It. It's a pandy and my kids are having fun inside the living room. Um, <laughs> but you can, you can, you're literally, we've agreed on this consensus um, right currency that it has value but it's, all, it's your, all your kids hate it clearly they don't they don't like that the government controls our currency i, I find it like hilarious that they just like they're just screaming and then they compete the two-year-old and the four-year-old be like ah! and then the four-year-old like ah! and then the two-year-old be like oh we're going there ah! and it's it's just oh my god i love seeing kids just be silly and have fun it's it's amazing oh, they're the they, best they have the best time they're with no drugs they barely doing even sugar and yeah. they're just high out of their minds on life it's my, my two-year-old will wake up and just be like, oh, oh, like super stoked. And I'm just like, oh my God, I freaking love it. It makes me so happy. So, but anyways. So, um, yeah. uh, so, the, so the scarcity of Bitcoin, that the reason why it's capped at 21 million. So scarcity creates value. That's why diamonds are valuable because it's so hard to find a diamond or gold is valuable. It's hard to get more gold, platinum, et cetera, any precious metal or you know, iron ore you can think of, or, you know, element. Uh, so that's what creates value is scarcity. And the idea that there's only 21 million, it's the only reason, the reason there is 21 million is that's just how the protocol is written. There will only ever be 21 million. Okay. Um, so that means it's finite. And by definition, a, a finite thing is going to be scarce as it increases in demand. And the reason why Bitcoin exploded this year was because, you know, a lot of companies were panicking about, losing the value of the currency. That's why there's, you know, Jack Dorsey, the creator of Twitter and Square in September, he invested about 50 million. He was trying to keep the price of Bitcoin at 10,000. So he invested 50 million when the coin hit about 10,000. And then Michael Saylor was this guy who owns a company called MicroStrategies. He converted his entire company's balance sheet of cash into Bitcoin. And overnight, he turned his company's net worth, which I think was like, you know, roughly maybe 500 million into a billion in a month because it doubled in price. It's a huge risk, by the way, though, to take 
to, to not risk. diversify, but at the same time, like the risk paid off. This is some of these psychopath um, uh, yeah. tra- traits that some of these CEOs and like leaders have, where you're just like, "Whoa, that was crazy!" But like we're making our way through the mind, the asteroid field or whatever. Yeah, you know, like I mean, but that's it's kind of good in its own way because it's showing you that the the the, the people who have money are believing in it, you know, and if, and if you can get more big whales on board, I mean, that's why they say it's the price of a Bitcoin could go up to a hundred K by the end of the year, 2021 and a million in 20 years is because then once you, cause right now it's what they call a retail investment, which means people, individuals like you and I mostly own it, just people. But now they're saying it's going to be a thing like gold or like an index fund Reserve where you're going to have, what's that? Is that a reserve currency, like a, a gold or an index fund? Is that? It's more of like a, what they would, I would use the term store value. Store value. Okay. That's a yeah, new That's the phrase I would use. For me. Okay. Yeah. Store value. Because it's just something that you want, a place to put you money that will, where the, the, the value of that, what is called a quote unquote investment vehicle will grow at a greater rate than the inflation or the devaluing of your currency. So where do you think, where do you think it's going? And again, disclaimer for our, our listeners, like we, we're just yeah. people talking and uh, we yeah. want to entertain and like kind of communicate ideas, but we don't really know, which by the way, just so our listeners know, anybody that tells you they know when it comes to spirituality, finance, the economy, or the housing market, when they say, here's exactly what's going to happen. Um, you will only find out in hindsight if they were right. No one knows ahead of time. So just this this is included in that we're People just we're speculating yeah. and we're saying it might do this we think it's going to do that but no one yeah. knows and as terrence Buchanan, one of my favorite weirdos always would say anyone who says they know what's going on it, it tells you that you should turn and run like that's it so yeah. we're just we're learning and speculating but okay where do you think it's going and, and for for yeah the I near think, future i think you're going to see a lot of volatility with it as because for one it's sort of it's in its history you know yeah, so that's part of but it's one of those things where you don't also want to sleep on it. I mean, personally, I bought uh, not a bunch, but I bought a little bit of. In- I I invested about two percent of my net worth, which is like you know, like Ooh, a that's grand. double what you're supposed to. <laughs> According to James Atherton, you just went wild and did double what you're supposed to invest. <laughs> it's so little, but I mean, when I you're not put- rich, dude, and they go like only invest one percent, you're like, so three hundred dollars? <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh <laughs> no, forty bucks. You're like, I can't buy anything for forty bucks. You're like, well, that's what Altiger said is the safest bet. And like, they <laughs> doesn't recommend anything more than one percent. I hear that st- stuff, and I'm just like, woo. Ooh, it's oh difficult to really build on that. So by the time yeah. I'm 140, I could invest maybe thirty thousand dollars. Totally, it's it's a super risky investment, and it could go up and down. But I I truly believe so because is of life, that, bro. I know the, the, at the core of Bitcoin is this problem of governments manipulating currency. Yeah. So that's what I don't see changing is governments manipulating currency. Yeah. So you're always going to need something to offset it. And so far, the best thing we have is Bitcoin. And that's why I because believe they can't in inflate it, is what you're saying. No government can touch it because, it, again, with this blockchain technology, you would have to either have all the miners who mine Bitcoin. And when I say mine, also think run the ledger. And when you he know, says when- miners, he doesn't mean people under 18. <laughs> all these kids running around they're into tiktok and bitcoin all the miners no he means miners like with a uh you know uh uh they're they're t- it's a technical way of describing how they're uncovering which again is another episode totally yeah but so like so the, the only way you can manipulate bitcoin is if you've got all the miners either under one company or mm-hmm. you know under in the same place but that's okay. so far it's not going to happen it's too competitive it's all over Europe. It's all over America. It's all over China. It's that's what's beautiful about Bitcoin is it's global. No government can go in and touch it. I, I mean, one of the things that sold me on it a long time ago when uh, Antonopoulos was on uh, Rogan five years ago or so was he was saying how you could have a uh, poor farmer in Nigeria, in, in somewhere in Africa where it doesn't necessarily, well, now it's been six years, they probably do have really good internet. But at the time, they didn't have much besides a cell phone, right? And it's, and right. it's, a, it's a farmer and you want to support them. And you don't right. want to give money to a third party charity and hope that the money gets to that farmer. Let's say you know this person or your friend is, like I have a friend that actually travels uh, every year with his church to go uh, do things in Africa, right? Sure. So let's say you know this person and you're like, I want to help this lady out. She, is, she needs money. This is my, yeah. my thing. 
you can literally send her Bitcoin straight through the phone and she just gets it. And you could be, it could be $5 or you could be a filthy rich person in America or in England or in France and say, I'm going to send so-and-so in Nigeria $500,000 tomorrow yeah. to, to begin her life. And you can just do that without yeah. having to ask a third party, without her having to have some sort of ID or relationship with a bank. You can just send it to her because we take for granted that, by the way, you know, in, in America yeah. and many Western countries, most of us that have any kind of job or financial history can have a bank account and credit cards. But somebody in one of these countries that doesn't have that access or even uh, just poverty anywhere, they can right. just get a hold of a cell phone and you can give this lady money right now. And there's that's something so powerful about that as a human that just wants the world to thrive, you know, and grow yeah. in, a, in a good direction. And I just find that to be one of the most beautiful things about Bitcoin, uh, aside from the fact that like the rallying and excitement <laughs> over like, it's going to be worth a ton of money, bro. I think it's so cool that like, you can just be like, kick dirt world bank. I'm just going to send this money directly there. Exactly. And that's what they call, uh, you know, that's been part of what they call microfinancing is, yeah. getting, you know, tiny amounts of money to people in very remote areas. And totally. the other big deal with that is what's called uh, remittance fees. Because if you send, you know, a check for 10,000, if you send like a hundred dollars to your family back in Mexico or Africa or Asia, you, places that will wire that money for you, if you don't have a bank or they don't have a bank, they charge a remittance fee of anywhere from 10 to 30%. Oh yeah. Just an insane. So if you're sending a hundred bucks back, you're only sending $70 back and 30 is going to the bank or, you know, that wire transfer company, which is wholly unfair. Yep. It's just totally. so terrible. So Bitcoin solves that quote unquote, remittance fee problem. I think that the network charges like a very small, like a few pennies on the dollar, right? Some, something well, charges you. There's somebody that's helping that facilitate it. That's taking some money from that transaction, but it's very small. Yeah. Well, there's, when if it's like, uh, I describe it, people are like, well, you know, I was are talking with my parents about this and they're like, well, how do you even buy Bitcoin? And I'm like, well, it's like any sort of broker, you're going to need to have an app, like an exchange app, just like you would for stock like Fidelity or Robinhood. You're going to need an app like Coinbase or something where you can go, oh, here's my money. Now I want Bitcoin. And they'll charge you a fee to convert your money into Bitcoin of, you know, whatever their transaction fees are, all things will be different, you know? And then the interaction of me sending it from, I don't personally know what that fee is or, you know, if there is one, if I send money to somebody else. Yeah. I know there's a fee to interchange current dollars to bitcoin but i don't know about there might be no fee to just or, yeah either yeah, way yeah. if there is it's small and that that's part of the whole the whole situation because yeah. i remember uh a while ago somebody sent, sent uh they, they did a test where they sent like a hundred million dollars from one company to some other account or something like that and it, it was a few dollars to send it and it was like which is incredible in the world oh, yeah. of finance totally I, yeah. and, and and by the way, I mean in the the housing world, it's hilarious how archaic some of the stuff is. Um, when a client goes into escrow, we wire the earnest money deposit right away, and uh, the it's so funny. Like Zil, uh, what do you call it? Zell, Zell or or Venmo is yeah. so much is so much easier. These people go to the bank, and you spend money to wire it, but they just give you a wiring number. And if one number off of this giant digit thing is off, it goes to the wrong people, and there's all this fraud risk involved. Right. And, and I, I, I joke with my other realtor friends. I'm just like, what is, why, why are we doing it this way? Like we're sending our clients to send $10,000 and then later, you know, the loan goes through, they have to wire hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. And they're just making sure this number is exactly, there's no profile link that just shows you like it's going to this bank, to this person. Like, nope. And it's like, what's going on? It's like, oh, we're using software from the seventies. Yeah. They're charging a bunch of money, taking forever to do these things to okay them. And I, I like the safeties of banks saying like, hey, we're going to verify this and that. But again, if you get the number wrong, and it just goes to the wrong people. I'm like, if I go to Venmo, I can see a picture of my friend on there. And it asks me for the phone number to confirm. And I'm like, okay, I know that I'm sending the money through Venmo. How is yeah. the bank not doing that with hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars? So it just shows you how a lot of our financial world is kind of uh, like the, the, the establishments kind of just like a lot of big industries. They've been comfortable for a long time. And they don't want to change certain stuff. And then a disruptor like Bitcoin comes along. And it's pretty interesting to see, like, how is this going to affect our world? And hopefully mostly in positive ways. So far, so good. Yeah. I mean, people are like, oh, well, Bitcoin's only used for terrible stuff, like, you know, the black market and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Silk Road or whatever the, 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 what do you call the dark web back in the day? Right. Like like, like, dollars weren't, like people haven't been uh, briefcases full of dollars. But that was media manipulation, you know? And I'm not a conspiracy theorist. However, uh the news is owned by a small group of people and whether they, whether it's a, uh, what do you call it? A concerted effort or not? Like they, 
they just go with whatever's dramatic for the stories and whatever oh, for sure you know gets yeah, the tribalism some- going so Old school Bitcoiners will bring that up. They'll go, oh, we'll say, you know, Bitcoin's only used for or it's mostly used for all this black market stuff. It's like, well, the number one currency for sex trafficking is the U.S. dollar. The number one currency for drug arms, arms deals is the U.S. dollar for drug trade, U.S. dollar. So it's like, okay, don't get on a moral high horse about currency. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, Totally. And and I I think the the other thing with... um, you know the 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 usage for it uh, that's really fascinating too is it's still an, it's still for nerds and people that are like really into it and passionate about it and yeah. you know i'm seeing it slowly get more and more mainstream they still have their right. issues to solve which i don't understand software or software you know um, problem solving but they still have stuff they need to solve and once it's as easy as the apple pay and using your credit card on your phone right that's when I see it like taking off and it's already doing so well without that, that I'm like, Oh, there's just such a bright future because I'm just like, it's already doing well and it's not easy to understand or use. But at some point you're not going to have to know the stuff that Peter and I are talking about right now and just be like, Oh, I'll use my Bitcoin for that. And that's when it's going to be like when, when people that aren't doing their homework are still just able to use Bitcoin. That's when it's going to be even more fascinating to see how it affects our world and hopefully how it affects, you know, the, the value of it as well. So. Right. That's a big thing PayPal's working on right now is they're trying to get it to the point where you can exchange Bitcoin through PayPal right now. And yeah. some websites do already offer payment through Bitcoin, you know, just as, as you'd click like, you know, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, exactly. Venmo, and drop down to Bitcoin as well. Oh, guarantee you Amazon will have that soon in the next five years. Like you'll just be able to like when you select which credit card to use or your Bitcoin or whatever else, you'll be able totally. to do it. So, um, well, I, I, I think that I have to go. I know you you were just like yeah, gracious, yeah. gracious enough. Thank you so much for just like last minute be like, yeah, let's podcast. <laughs> dude, Bitcoin, I'm always excited to talk about Bitcoin. Yeah, dude, next time we, we got to talk about, about apps. let's talk about more about the mining next time. And and um, what do you say, dating apps? Yeah, that's all I talk about in dating apps. Like, do you want dude, Bitcoin? You should, What's your Bitcoin? Dude, BitTinder, I actually do really well <laughs> on BitTinder. The ladies won't talk to me on regular Tinder, but my profile pick with my Bitcoin? <laughs> They are into it. My big pile of digits. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Dude. I love it. Dude, the porn, the porn, uh, porn cryptocurrency, but coin. Oh, it's so hot. <laughs> so hot. But coins <laughs> doing really well, dude. <laughs> it's up to like 35,000 squirts. <laughs> uh, guys, thank you so much for listening. Uh, Peter, where, where do you think people should, what's your recommendation? I was jokingly saying at the beginning of the podcast, go listen to Rogan, talk to the experts, but where do you think people should research Bitcoin more? Just watch YouTube a- videos or? I mean, no, some big, no, the, the, the YouTube videos on Bitcoin can get really sinister and very hip, like conspiracy theorist, really bad, really quick. But Peter, that's where all my education is from YouTube University. I, I, I don't have any other kind of accredited info. Oh, God. <laughs> that's oh, the no. institution. Is, I'm just joking. Okay. No, where do you think they should go? Yeah, I really say avoid YouTube, but there's a podcast that's called uh, We Study Billionaires. And they have two podcasts, one's geared towards stock, and then one's geared toward Bitcoin. And the Bitcoin one is fairly new. That's how I got on board. They've only got six or seven episodes out. It started in about mid-November. But it's called We Study Billionaires, and all the Bitcoin episodes episodes start with the three letters BTC. And they interview great people. They're super knowledgeable. They're all investors. They're all tech people. I highly recommend that. That's cool. I want to check that. And, and no, normally they tell you, I, I know one of my friends told me like, you're not supposed to ever recommend people to leave your platform or whatever else, but I want, I want my listeners to be able to get educated on this. So I, I hope that uh, you guys go check it out and still come back to fantasy house for more good stuff. But uh, <laughs> no, that's, that's great. And where, where can people find you? Where, where do you want them to, to look you up? Yeah, I'm on, uh, you can find me on Twitter at banana Chowski. <laughs> this is way too long. I got to change my name. No, it's great, dude. Don't ever take bananas. I tried to take bananas out of my diet, and it was a disaster. Don't you take that out of your name. (laughs) Folks, go find Banana Chowski. (gasps) They're like, there's so much sugar in them. It's not healthy. I was like, you're not taking away my bananas, okay? (laughs) You can take away my baguettes, but they'll fry the bananas out of my cold. Your baguettes? Yeah, like bread. Well, I'm like, they, they tell you like, eat healthy. And I'm like, okay, I'll give up rice except for on cheat days. I'll give up bread and French fries except for on cheat days. But then they're like, also bananas. Like, you're fucking insane. <laughs> bananas? I mean, the, the chimpanzees, the gorillas, they're so healthy. They eat bananas. They're the strongest ones in the jungle. Come on. Dude, you, and you can say, you don't have to worry about the toilet paper shortage. If you just live on bananas, like your poop is just like, you don't even have to wipe. 
So, I mean, come on, like bananas are, they're, they're from God. They're a gift from God. And just like you are, Peter, thank you so much for doing this, man. Thank you.